All right, today we're going to start talking about part two in the book. Uh, for the second chapter, we're going to talk about social influence. These next four chapters are all tied together because what these are is really those forces in the world that are influencing our behavior. We think that we have free will and, and all of that, but we don't have free will completely because much of our decision making and many of the things we do is influenced by these other forces. Today, at fir you know, the first thing we're going to talk about is culture and evolution and biological constraints, but we'll move on. I mean, just to give you a simple example of what this is, unit is about, most people believe that they're not persuaded by um, commercials. They say, oh, commercials, they, they, you know, they influence other people. Other people buy stuff because they're coming, but not me. Well, you do. We all do. We're all influenced by this stuff. Even when we're not aware of it, we don't really have free will, and these are the social forces or the forces which affect our social behaviors. Okay? Um, well, today we're going to talk very, very little bit about, uh, of course, well, nature versus nurture. All right, whatever. Um, you all know nature versus nurture. But we're going to talk about evolution a little bit and culture a little bit. Suffice it to say what these are is two different ways of helping to understand human behaviors. Um, yeah, here, let, let's do a real brief look at evolution, but not huge because this is social psych. It's not some other bio class or something. People have known about evolution for thousands of years. By evolution, what I mean is simply the change in a species across time. And by definition, I mean, come on, I've got this little, uh, what do I have? I have a Shih Tzu at home. And this stupid little Shih Tzu is technically uh, bred from a wolf, okay? The species changed, okay? It is totally different. In that sense, evolution is not controversial. I mean, unless you can deny every single fossil that's ever been pulled out of the earth. However, the second problem is, of course, how does it happen? And in that second sense, evolution is, in fact, a theory. Because lots of people are questioning, of course, the most famous explanation for how evolution occurs is going to be called natural selection, which is Darwin's answer to that question. But before Darwin, there was Jean Lamarck. And Jean Lamarck's idea here is called inheritance of acquired characteristics. And that is to say, we start with this giraffe on the far side over there. I don't know, I guess that's your left, right? That far left there, and it's got this funky short neck. And what happens is when there's not enough food to eat, when there's a time of a drought, that weird giraffe on the left is going to stretch his neck really far and change himself. And when this giraffe then has babies, its babies will have longer necks. Now, it's obvious that we can mutilate our own bodies, right? I mean, you look at those Ethiopian women with the neck rings and stuff. Yeah, you can do that stuff. But when these Ethiopian women with neck rings have babies, do their babies have long necks? No. Okay, it doesn't work like that. Otherwise, we'd have a whole generation of tattooed babies running around. Okay, that's not how evolution works. So, before Darwin, there were some facts. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, Darwin is one of my favorite historical figures, but he's not quite the genius that a lot of people make him out to be. Because a lot of the stuff that Darwin did was simply bring together some ideas that were already there. Thomas Malthus had taught us that. Um, Populations always outstrip food supply. That is to say, there will always be more animals than there is food. Or, or more specifically, he argued that um, population rises, what am I trying to say, geometrically in a curve like this, whereas food supply tends to rise arithmetically in a, in a line. And when the two cross, what's inevitably going to happen is there's going to be more animals than there is food, and somebody is going to die. Okay. And so what happens is that, the, uh, what, what did Darwin come up with is that there's variability in these organisms. Some have necks that are a little longer, some that are a little shorter. I'm going back to the giraffes. It's just natural variability. And what happens is that those giraffes that happen to have longer necks and there's just not enough food around, they're the ones that can reach a little bit higher. They're more likely to survive. And then the second fact, which is true, is that babies tend to resemble parents. And therefore, if the longer neck giraffes are the ones that are more likely to survive, they're more likely to have babies that also have longer necks. Okay? And this is what natural selection is really all about. Okay? Uh, yeah, go on. Um, remember, you can get all of these PowerPoints off of Blackboard, by the way. Okay? 
Um, I want to get through. Well, very briefly, as I said, in evolution is not controversial in, in, in some ways. As I said, my Shih Tzu and a Great Dane, right? I mean, come on, give me a break. They're both dogs. But what happens is that these two dogs can still have interbreed and have baby dogs, right? So it's not a new species. And this is where evolution gets controversial, and this is where the religion comes in, because speciation is a process of actually developing a new species. Suffice it to say, they have done this stuff in laboratories. The problem is, is that speciation is something that occurs across thousands of generations. It's very hard to see it because the lifespan of an organism tends to be too long, and therefore we don't live long enough to see this. But when you do the right studies with fruit flies, it's not terribly difficult to make a new species of fruit fly. All you got to do is isolate these things and wait 50 generations, and then pretty soon, no more, they don't have any baby fruit flies. All right, whatever. I want to move on. My point behind that is that a lot of what we are and a lot of what we do comes from a shared genetic heritage, an ancestry that we share. One of my favorite um, theories, I don't have it here, mismatch theory. Mismatch theory basically tells us that our, uh, well, they tells us that we are ideally suited for a world that no longer exists, okay? Your body responds exactly as it should to some caveman environment. Well, we don't have a, we don't live in a, because biological evolution and cultural evolution are two different monsters. And cultural evolution, especially in recent times, exceeds, far exceeds the rate of biological evolution. We find that organisms, uh, bio biology doesn't change. So we find all kinds of funky things, like when men are promoted, their testosterone level goes up. When men are away from their wife for two days, their testosterone level goes up. I mean, us horn dogs, right? The, men's, the men get all randy in situations where, oh my goodness, OK? And so I'm saying, hey, you can't blame John Edwards, right? <laughs> no, that's not true, all right? But we also find that, uh, here, I want to, in fact, here's a little, a little one. I'm going to give you this idea first. Uh, this is a neat idea. It's a little different. I'm going to give you a really bad stereotype. I know, I know. Get ready. Um, when I was a kid growing up, though this is not so much true anymore, in fact, um, when I was a kid growing up, everybody knew. In fact, I'm going to give you the nature versus nurture here for a second. Um, I remember growing up, everybody knew that Asian people were short. That's just a fact. They're just short. They're short, right? And they all were. And uh, now I go to a Korean church, right? And these Korean teenagers are just monsters. These kids are just like nine feet tall or some crap, and they're only 13. It's like, what is going to happen to these kids? And in the end, what happens is, of course, uh, when, when these Korean families sit down to lunch, you've got, you know, the Korean grandmothers, the Korean parents, and the Korean teenagers, all right? And it's just crazy to see this. And it's simply because, um, like my, my, uh, my father-in-law, when he was growing up during the Korean War, on a daily basis, he had barley and kimchi. That's it. There was no other food. My wife said when she was growing up, at least she had rice, but meat was like once a week. Nowadays, these kids are getting anything you can imagine, everything you can imagine. And so what we find is that there's that the... The potential was inside of them for, for generation after generation, but it took the right environment to trigger their potential. But anyway, I, I'm going to go back and pretend this idea that um, Asians are shorter than Americans. I know, it's such, a, such a, a racist thing, but here I go. By this, what I mean is that the average of one group is less than the average of the other, but there's lots of variability in that group. Within the American group, there's lots of people that are quite tall and lots that are quite short. The average, however, is larger than the average. So what we find is there can be a truth to this statement. Group B is larger than group A, while being millions upon millions of exceptions to the rule, all of the overlap points. So we find that, um, well, whatever. I don't know what we find. But let me, let me move on to what, what's really interesting. As I, as I said at the beginning, and I kind of lost track on it, um, a lot of what you do is, in fact, influenced by unseen forces that you don't know about, and that biology is a big one. Here is, in fact, a really cool study. I think this was Ekman's study. And Ekman showed that um, he, he took pictures of American people, and he posed them. And he was like, OK, I want you to smile. I want you to, all right, let me see what she's doing. 
she's happy, she's surprised, he's scared, she's sad, she's mad, he's disgusted. Okay, boom, simple. And he had these people pose these pictures, and then he took them to other American people, and the other American people, they read them, no problem, it was simple. He then took these, and he took these pictures to people in Papua New Guinea that had no experience with Western media, and they knew exactly what they were. Then he had the people in Papua New Guinea show them the same, you know, the, the smiles and everything, and they, they brought them back to America, and they looked at I mean, everybody around the world sees it. Even better, a blind person, when they're happy, guess what they do? When a blind person is surprised, guess what they look like? When a blind person is scared, this is how they respond. And it, a blind person has never seen another person, all right? There's no culture involved. It's just hardwired into us. In fact, look at these babies here. These babies here, they, you can't ask these babies to pose these pictures. This is just what babies do without being taught. When a baby is happy, they giggle and they laugh and they smile. When you steal a kid's binky, he gets pissed off. I mean, they're pretty straightforward. They're, it's, it's biology and it's, it's pulling us even if we don't believe it. No, no, no. Mm, cool, but no, I don't want to get into too much. Suffice it to say, well, here, well, no, I don't want to. Okay, suffice it to say, much of what we are is pre-programmed. In particular, things like language. Turns out that these language centers in our brain are um, way different from an, another animal. And we find that a lot of aspects of language are hardwired in um, without getting a lot of details again. It turns out you can teach a monkey sign language, ooh, 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 but that monkey will never learn grammar. But when it comes to a two-year-old child, they know grammar. How do they know grammar? I don't know. I can't, I don't know. I can't verbalize it. Kids just pick this stuff up, okay? Because their brain is wired and makes them ready for language, okay? So let me quick get to a good point because I'm going to have to stop here in a minute and I want to make sure, oh, this is great. They went to 30 different cultures and they gave them different adjectives and they said, tell me, you know, if this is a male adjective or a female adjective. You know, active, men, hard-headed, men, greedy, men, and how about women? Women are affectionate, fickle, talkative, touchy, pleasant. And so it turned out that all over the world, in fact, here is two, two slides in a row of um, different words that belong to each gender. And it turned out that all over the world, these are universal. These are not culturally based. This is, this is biology, buddy. Why am I, as a male, more arrogant? <laughs> not my fault, right? Why am I more coarse? Yeah, that's me. Loud is in there somewhere. I know that. I own that one. So why am I that way? Because that's who I am. I'm just biologically programmed that way. And therefore, it's going to influence my social behaviors. Okay? And the women have their own things. Um, I will take a pause there and come back in a minute and see you then.